Quick. New um, academic <laughs> labs are moving from information to spatial information labs. One of the greatest history spatial information projects I'm aware of is Stanford University's Spatial History Lab. These are letters of Voltaire patterns. Um, this is a dynamic visualization, patterns in time, botanical data through time you can look at. Columbia University Spatial Information Design Lab, looking at cultural patterns over here on the left. Sarah Williams, who is now um, uh, who came from MIT, but it now is heading up the Columbia University's lab, and looking at uh, at um, pollution patterns. Another big thing we're not we don't see a lot of it yet, but we've got to expand our historical arcs, broader historical narratives. Earth in her dynamic context of nested time cycles. The ancients understood this. We need to look at the cosmic cycles, such as the Saros eclipse cycles, the metonic lunar cycles, 19 year lunar cycles, the paleoclimatological drivers in space, like the Milankovitch cycles, uh, obliquity, eccentricity, and precession, um, and all the way down to the carbon cycles on Earth. We need to be able to see these time frame influences on our climate and on our Earth. Rates of change are at different scales, um, but they are synchronic if we're able to view them. USGS uh, in 2008 released a new way of looking at the time spiral. Uh, in this, on the right, you see the new tree of life that the European Molecular uh, Biology Lab created an interactive genomic tree of life. All of this blue is archaea and, and bacteria. And according to Bonnie Bassler of Harvard University, we ourselves are communities of bacteria. We're 90% of bacteria at any time. So communities within communities within communities, <coughs> visualizing time and space on the scale of life on Earth. We aren't the ones who are going to save the planet, by the way. Uh, the archaea are doing their job, bacteria is doing their job, phytoplankton is doing their job, all that slime and the forests are doing their job. We're not looking hard enough at, and we need to get with the program. We keep thinking, oh, we're going to save the earth. We need to get with the program. Where do we fit in this teeny little place? We are such a tiny part of the scheme of things. So humility is kind of big in this uh, you know, journey that we're on. The cosmic calendar, we need to think in terms of the cosmic calendar. The universe in one year. Where are we on that one year? We're in the very tiny end. Not even a day. We don't even fit in a day. So who's elevating the dialogue and transcending time scales? Uh, David McConville, looking at the Universe Atlas, uh, Transcalar Imaginary, taking us through time and space. Uh, wonderful Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, we just saw that. A uh, new one that was inspired by him. Kevin W. Kelly and Rachel Bagby are, uh, created a new, I can't show it here, a new uh, visualization clock that shows the rising of the tree of life at the same time that Earth is moving through space so that we can see these longer arcs. He's trying to uh, integrate now the Milankovitch cycles and then the fly downs to carbon. Um, uh, we want to increase personal commitment. General public need to know, we need to know our individual and collective decisions fit into this uh, larger, you know, our ecological handprint. We've got to see that we make a difference. So Stephen, Har Stephen Harding, who worked with, um, with uh, uh, Gaia, <laughs> Um, theory um, for many, many years with Lovelock. Uh, he encouraged us to engage Carl Jung's four ways of knowing. Intuition, our visceral and gut level response, sensing, our sensory awareness, feeling, ethical response, and thinking. We need to tell new stories. Great story, consummate storyteller Hans Rosling has g given us time visualizations and he tells stories about disparity of access to resources and things through time that will change our actions. Climate awareness and real-time reflexivity. Uh, I think the COP15 really brought a lot of people together to explore different ways of showing impacts. Uh, climate mapper on world wind, showing carbon emissions of power plants. Climate clock for real-time feedback loops of, uh, of human behavior. Um, in the air, visualizing almost like a net, what the air looks like. 
carbon mapping on Google Earth, which is actually California as being one of the, the most important and first states who are involved in it. Schwarzenegger has a, a mandate now that we are working with the first year of uh, looking at California. Over on the right, you can see the energy demands in California from the Department of, Educa uh, of uh, Environment. Um, but also designers, again, design science, are giving us a way to do augmented reality on our iPhones that enable us to see the patterns of air pollution or carbon uh, emissions in our own locale. So again, information harvesting. All of the uh, information is being gathered, and what does it look like when we put it back out? The Copenhagen Wheel was released by the Sensable City Project, uh, Sensable City Lab at MIT, and this will greatly change the way we look at the sociosphere. And then finally, we need to synchronize our decision support with a convergence of tools. So let's get back to this idea of a geoscope or an immersive Earth. The real-time views enable policymakers to move toward unbiased decisions in a longer time frame. And also, augmented reality is going gangbusters right now. It's infiltrating everywhere. Autodesk, if you go up to the Autodesk gallery at uh, uh, one at the middle of San Francisco, you'll see that hyperwalls, here's Eric Frost in front of a hyperwall looking at data as it's real time coming in on these large walls to make decisions very fast. Um, geographic information systems is aligning with building information systems so that we can see not only the behavior of the buildings as we build them, but also how that affects our environment. And, and LEED certification uh, is also a part of these the tool sets. And then at MIT, Sixth Sense brings us right over to Minority Report. So maybe we won't have an iPad in another two years. Maybe we'll just have these little things on our fingers and everything we see, I can just bring that up over there or bring that up over here and, and be able to see the output as well as the input. And Earth simulation environments go back a long ways. We already saw that um, with the uh, immersive Earths. Louis Fry Richardson, who was a meteorologist, he created this notion of a weather factory with 64,000 human computers. Uh, computers in a way, um, computing weather information in 1922. But the only huge Earth simulator we have right now started in 2002 is in Yokohama, and it doesn't do the whole Earth. Projection systems are, work nice. NOAA's Science on a Sphere has been around about 10 years in most museums. Uh, Japan has Geocosmos. And Al Gore, uh, Suggested in November 2009, climate modeling aided by supercomputing can make impossibly large phenomena small enough to see and impossibly small phenomena large enough for us humans to see and induce a type of visceral reactions that spur political change. So we need to have that visceral reaction. And he's created the International Center for Earth Simulation. Bob Bishop, he um, uh, had just launched that in January. Uh, it has capability that we've never had before, 20 year transition to petaflop, exaflop, and zetaflop. And with that, it gives me a lot, of, um, a lot of excitement about how all of these will converge and how our technology and our design will enhance the ability for everybody to be an information harvester and a steward. Yay. Yay. Oh. Yay. Sorry. I did the long version. Yay. Sorry.